Well, thank you so much. I'd like to say how very thankful I am for the very real privilege that has been mine each morning in this way to share with you the good things of our Lord Jesus. And uh, as this is the concluding session of this particular series each morning, I'd just like to thank you for the privilege of talking to you, for the courteous way in which you've listened, and trust that beyond your wildest dreams you'll continue to prove the adequacy of the one who is God in the man is never ever less than big enough. Because uh, that's the truth. That is the truth. I can do all things. That would sound like the boast of a braggart if it weren't for the fact that the apostle then went on to say, through Christ, who is my strength. In other words, all I've got to do is let him demonstrate how big God is and prepare to be in a man who knows he's that small, that apart from who he is, he is nothing, has nothing, and can do nothing. But because of who he is, living where he does, all that he is I've got, I can't have more and never, in, never need to enjoy less. That's the sublime simplicity of the gospel. The Christian life is a miracle. Because a Christian is somebody who cannot possibly happen apart from Jesus Christ. God looked into the heart of a small, young, teenager boy with a bunch of sheep on a hillside. And God said, I've got a king. I've got a king. Because, you see, as he looked into the heart of that boy, he knew that there was a boy who knew that God was bigger than bears, bigger than lions, bigger than giants, and was prepared by a disposition of heart called the perfect heart, to let God prove it. And he did. I got a king. For the eyes of the Lord run to and fro throughout the whole earth, looking for any boy, girl, man or woman, anywhere, whose heart being perfect toward him is prepared to allow God to show himself strong on his or her behalf. In other words, David had learned a principle to live by. A principle that was shared by his great, great, great grandson. Who learned from the first ways of his father Asa. And from his father David. A principle to live by. And in the 116th Psalm, to which we'll turn this morning, David bears his testimony. If I may just mention to the folks back there on my left in the corner, those folks coming in who don't know where to sit, tell them to come straight down here. There's some very, very comfortable seats here in the corner. Just as hard as the ones you're sitting on. <laughs> so... Don't let them wander embarrassed at the back. Just push them forward. There are some more here too. In this 116th Psalm, David bears his testimony. This is what he says. He says, I love the Lord because he hath heard my voice and my supplications. Because he hath inclined his ear unto me, therefore will I call upon him. Invoke his divine activity. Reckon with who he is and let him loose as long as I live. I've learned a principle to live by. I've discovered that God cares enough to listen and I've discovered that he's big enough to do something about it. It's a principle to live by. It's the principle that he learned as a kid on the hillside when he knew that God was bigger than bears and bigger than lions and bigger than giants. But then, surprisingly enough, then in his testimony, he goes on to say in verse 3, The sorrows of death compass me, and the pains of hell got hold upon me. I found trouble and sorrow. That's the cry of a man in distress, at the end of his rope on his back, 
What he's saying is that I was afraid to die, and I wasn't even fit to live. Because, you see, David, too, was numbered amongst those of whom we read in God's word who forgot to remember. How kind God is to remind us of these things. That our noblest and our very best, even though numbered amongst God's friends and those whom he could choose, we're but an earthen vessel. That which simply contains the treasure. That always and at all times the excellency of the power may be of God. A God who knows the worst about us and incredibly loves us just the same. And there's only one who loves like that. And Jesus is his name. He forgot to remember. And there came a day when committing murder by proxy, sending a man to the forefront of the battle knowing that he would die so that he could steal his wife. David. David forgot to remember. And as we sit here this morning, you can allow the Holy Spirit who searches the hearts to remind us of those occasions when we have forgotten to remember. The sorrows of death compassed me, the pains of hell got hold upon me, I found trouble and sorrow. But then, in my extremity, <laughs> Then called I upon the name of the Lord, O Lord, I beseech thee, deliver my soul. Gracious is the Lord, and righteous, yea, our God, our God is merciful. The Lord preserveth the simple. When I got back to the basic simplicity of my relationship to God, he had mercy. He preserves the simple. I was simple enough to realize that I was nothing, that God is everything. That I'm only at home base when I'm prepared to be who he, be, prepared to let him be who he is. The creator. And I just, the imperfect creature. I was brought low, he says, in verse 6. I was on my back. And he helped me. Of course, his confession, as all of us know, is found recorded for us in the 51st Psalm. Against thee, thee only have I sinned and done this evil in my sight. Renew, renew a right spirit. Restore to me that true disposition that lets you be who you are, regnant within every area of my being, resident and president within my soul, in the totality of my humanity. I want you to be God again. Restore a right spirit within me. Give me a clean heart, what I don't have. And then again, sinners will be converted because... A broken heart and a contrite spirit you will not despise. And David, together with Jehoshaphat, was one of those who, unlike Asa, forgot to remember, but not too proud to be reminded. So where did David rediscover the principle he had known as a teenage kid on the hillside in the moment of despair? The sad thing is this, that you and I normally either have to discover the principle that we never knew or be reminded of a principle that once we knew but then forgot when we're on our bags. When we're reminded of our own inherent bankruptcy. We are nothing, have nothing, and can do nothing. All that the Lord Jesus was prepared Though the creative deity, the God who threw the universes into space when he came to assume your humanity and mine, humbled himself, emptied himself, made himself all that he knew man to be apart from God. Nothing. Incredible. And born a human being. So that for every moment of his days, he refused to allow there to be any possible explanation for anything that he did or said or was. But the Father is God. In his incarnate son as man. Without my father. I am nothing. I can do nothing. I had nothing. Even the words that I speak unto you. I speak not of myself. 
They don't have their origin in me. My father who dwells in me, he does the work. We've reminded ourselves of this, his disposition. Not a one who needed to repent, but that disposition that cannot but be evident in those who've learned to repent. My doctrine isn't mine. He that believeth on me, said the Lord Jesus, doesn't believe on me. Extraordinary thing for the Lord Jesus to say. John chapter 12 and verse 44. Jesus cried and said, He that believes on me, believeth not on me, but on him that sent me. All I'm doing in the discharge of my office as man is to allow my father to make articulate upon my lips those things he wants to say. So when you listen to me speak, you hear what God says. Incredible. That's why he went on to say, he that has seen me has seen him that sent me. Because my office in the sinlessness of my humanity is to be. It's my father's office as God to act. That's why you see, he saying to us, as my father sent me, I send you the spirituality of what you're doing is never, ever, ever to be determined by the nature of the act. Only by its origin. He never to be the object of your activity, because then you become the origin of that activity of which he is the object. At all times, the Lord Jesus, and exclusively, must be the object, not of our activity, doing your best for Jesus. He's got to be the object of our faith that invokes his activity. And then he being the object of our faith becomes the origin of activity and the world doesn't see what we are doing for him. The world sees at last what he can do through us. And that's the Christian life. That's why it's a miracle. But it's so difficult to learn and we're so slow to be reminded. But what a wonderful thing it is when it happens. What release of his divine energy. What emancipation. Said he, if only you'll abide in my word, you'll discover at last the truth. That's the divine principle. It, recognize, it, it represents the divine logic. And that truth, the divine logic, will set you free. That I am through my indwelling Holy Spirit is indispensable to you in your humanity. As my Father was then by the Holy Spirit indispensable to my humanity. That truth will set you free. Because you'll then learn to look to me one step at a time as I so gladly looked to my father one step at a time. I suppose it must be 15, 20 years ago. And a pastor went into despair in his backyard. He sat under a tree with his head in his hands and sobbed like a child. He was broken. He was not an insincere, sincere man. He was, he was a good man. He loved Jesus Christ. He believed the Bible. He sought to minister to his people week by week. But he felt inside, bankrupt, burned out, despairing, discouraged, fit to quit, and did. And then he stumbled with tear-filled eyes back into the home. And on a table in the sitting room, he saw a little paperback. It was one of the many books that people in their goodness had offered him so that he might be encouraged in his ministry for they recognized that he was discouraged. But he hadn't read it. He was sick and tired of reading books. But for some strange reason on this particular occasion he picked it up and began to read it. It was a very excellent book. I wrote it. <laughs> it was uh, called... The saving life of Christ. <clears throat> Mind you, it isn't very smart because it took me 12 chapters to explain what God explains in one verse. So it can't be all that smart. <laughs> Romans 15.10, if when we were enemies we were reconciled to God by the death of his son, there's the redemptive act that Peter had to discover. But that verse goes on to say, if when we were enemies we were reconciled to God by the death of his son, much more a million times, much more than knowing that your sins are forgiven, that your destination has been changed, that you're going to heaven instead of hell, much, much more than that, being reconciled, we shall be saved by his life. That salvation comprehends not only the precious blood of the Lamb without blemish, verily foreordained before ever the world was, but that we are born again by his resurrection from the dead. Because the life, the only man that then had that life on earth 
for which man was made since Adam fell. That life, God's life that he laid down, restored to him now by him, is restored to us. For the Christian life is the life that he lived then in his own body, lived now by him in yours and mine. That's why we can say to me, to live is Christ. I'm a Christian. For Christianity is Christ in unity. Every moment of every day. He made the great discovery that though he had thanked the Lord Jesus for his death for him and with no little zeal and no little skill and no little sincerity, he was doing his best for him. He had never come to understand that the one who died for him was the one who rose again to live in him. And he discovered the truth that sets men free. And it was... Not he then that went into the pulpit the following Sunday. It was Jesus Christ at last clothed with the redeemed humanity of a forgiven sinner who had discovered the substance of his faith. Christ himself. Not his gifts, not his blessings, not his ministry. Himself. Because that's what it takes to be a Christian. Now I didn't know anything about this. It was several years later that I got on a plane from New York via Atlanta heading for somewhere else. <laughs> and there was a couple who got on that plane in Atlanta and sat alongside. And we got into conversation and I discovered, to my delight, that they too were Christians. And we had a time of rich fellowship together, Ross and Ovella Arna. And I discovered they lived at Morristown and said that uh, in September I was going to be in Knoxville for a conference there. And they were very delighted because it's only 30 miles away. They said, we'll be there. And they were on the Sunday morning. But you know, in Morristown there lived that man who had gone out to his yard and wept under the tree in despair. And they knew him. <laughs> and when he, from their lips, heard that I was going to be in Knoxville with some delight, he said, I'll come too. Well, he wasn't there on the Sunday. But, you know, just towards the end of the message on Wednesday evening, I could see through a sort of glass screen at the back of the church the silhouette of a couple of policemen. And one of them came in and had a conversation with uh, one of the officers of the church. He was trying to persuade him that there was a real emergency and that he should come forward and interrupt what was going on and, and make the announcement. He was trying to persuade him that I was nearly at the end of my message, which was a very optimistic view of the situation. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, finally, anyway, <laughs> the policeman prevailed and this man came forward, had a little conversation with the pastor. And I could see all this going on. It was a little distracting. So finally I said, maybe somebody ought to make an announcement. <laughs> and with some relief, the pastor got up and said, is there a, a Bob Snyder here? That was the name of that pastor. He said, there's a message. Would you please go to the back? And he went. And when he went to the back, the policeman said, there's been an accident. Call the hospital. It's your teenage boy. And when he did, he learned that on his motorcycle, he had been involved in a wreck, and his back was broken. His spinal cord was severed, and he'd never walk again. And I was told later that the face of that man just lit up. And his first reaction, Lord Jesus... Thank you. You're big enough. Even for this. He was. They hadn't told the boy. They left it to be the unhappy responsibility of his dad to tell him. When he went to see him in the hospital, I didn't speak to him that night. I didn't know what had happened. He was lying paralyzed totally from the neck down. And Dan, with somewhat of a smile on his face, said, Dad, I'm going to sell that motorbike which was a pretty good idea, I'd say. <laughs> Not that there was much left, I understand, to sell. But he said, with what I get, I'm going to get one of those little motorbikes, just for track stuff, you know, in the hills. And his dad said, Dan, you won't need that 
motorcycle or any other. You see, son, your back is broken. Your spine is severed. You'll never walk again. He said, you're kidding. No, son, he said, I'm not. That's true. I'm sorry. But it's true. The kid thought for a bit. And then his face lit up. He said, Dad, if that's what the Lord Jesus wants for my life, that's okay. That's okay. Dan has never walked again. He's in a wheelchair. But I'll tell you something. It's okay. It's okay. I'm glad that a man wept beneath a tree in his backyard so that out of despair from a little paperback he could discover that there is no situation in life that can ever arise at any time for which Jesus Christ can be less than big enough. And that it could so demonstrate the truth of it in a man's life that his son would discover the same principle from his dad. That truth could rub off in the reality of Christ's divine indwelling, clothed with the humanity of a man out of despair, discovered the substance of his faith. Now, that's what's so exciting about preaching Christ. Not Christianity. Not the needs of the world, just Christ. If there's anybody who's fully aware and conscious of the needs of this world, it's our Lord Jesus. Give him the right to be God who came into this world to seek and save that which is, lo that which is lost. Let our humanity be available to him to let all God loose. And what do you think he will do in our humanity made available to him who came to seek and save that which is lost? He'll be on the job. You don't have to twist his arm. He's just on tiptoe to show himself strong on the behalf of any boy, girl, man or woman anywhere who will let him show himself strong. His strength made perfect in our weakness. I got a, call, a phone call from Sebastopol in Northern California on one occasion. It was from the pastor of a church, wondered whether I'd have lunch with him and one of his church members. I was in Los Altos at the time, and he came down and we lunched together. And it was an invitation to visit his church. And he introduced me to the man who came with him. He said, it's this man that's persuaded me to come and invite you. His name was Fred Gentler. At that time, United Airlines, as the other airlines, needed navigators, and he was one of them. They don't need them now. Because, you see, the pilots don't fly the planes. Electronic devices do, but the pilots still get paid. <laughs> anyway, <laughs> you see, it was by the persuasion of this particular gentleman that I was invited to that church. And uh, about two and a half years later, I was there. And I had a young fellow traveling with me, as I do have now. hope some of you have met him, Rick Schoon. He's the son of our director in Sweden. And this boy, I had the joy of leading to Christ when he was a kid of 12, also in Florida. He was in St. Petersburg. And uh, my watch didn't work. And so um, I asked him if I could borrow his. And he said, yes, on one condition, you don't wear it. Because there's a link in the chain that's weak and you get excited when you speak and you begin to wave your arms around. And I know what's going to happen to my watch, so I promised faithfully that I wouldn't wear it. But I have to admit on the Monday morning, I forgot to remember. <laughs> and I wore it and sure enough I got excited, my arms began to spin and up went the watch, bounced off the ceiling, landed on the floor. And now neither of us had a watch. <laughs> that went. The next morning, Fred Gentner, the one-time navigator pilot of the United Airlines, who's a very dear friend of mine, saw him again last fall, though he's now retired, but fantastically in business. And primarily amongst young people, sharing the good news that he had to discover at infinite cost. For he came the following morning to me with this watch, the one I'm wearing right now. He said, my wife asked me whether you'd receive it as our gift. Well, I said, as a matter of fact, it meets a very, very real need at this particular moment of time. And I'm so glad that I accepted the offer and received it. It's a good watch. 
That afternoon, he took me down to San Francisco, where I had to, British, uh, to, to visit British Airways to get a ticket that needed some amendment. And on the way, he told me the story of this watch. <clears throat> he said, you see, I only got converted fairly late in life. And I had a sin singularly unhappy marriage until finally my wife died in a mental institution. And we were childless. But I married again. I married a widow. She had three sons. And her marriage, too, had been singularly unhappy. For her husband was a brutal man. He was always involved in fights and brawls. And hostile. He died. And we married, and I had three stepsons. He said the younger of those boys was a very free, sweet, sort of gentle-hearted boy, very tender and a little nervous, self-conscious. But he was drafted into the United States services and sent to Germany. And because of his tenderness and sensitivity, he had a very rough time. His commander gave him a very bad time until finally he became totally depressed and easy prey for those miserable, wicked individuals who push drugs. Got him first hooked on marijuana and then on the hard stuff until he shot his brain. He was discharged from the United States services on medical grounds, could hardly find his way home. And one night his mother disarmed him, took the gun out of his hand. But during the night he left the home, broke into his older brother's home, took a gun from his gun case and they found his body the next day in the woods. He killed himself. He said, my oldest son, stepson, he inherited the violent traits of his dad. He too would be involved constantly in fights and brawls. But during his university career, studying to become an architect, he got over that disability. And finally, one day, sitting in a restaurant, discussing with the owner certain things that needed to be done... A long-haired, greasy, hippie type came in and was extremely vulgar to a girl, and my older boy rebuked him. And this creature went out, got a gun, waited for him, and shot him dead on the restaurant steps. Within a few months, I lost two boys. Happy to tell you that my middle boy is a fine Christian. At that time, he was in Bible school. But he said it was then that I had to go on assignment to Okinawa in Japan and the bottom had fallen out of life. But I bumped into an American serviceman. He was a Christian. And I, for no one better to tell the story, I unloaded my knee in my despair. And that young man said... Uh, why don't you go to the missionary bookshop and find a little paperback? It's called The Saving Life of Christ. <laughs> well, he did, you know, and there was just one copy. And I believe, if I remember rightly, it was second hand. He took it to the hotel and read it all night and made a great discovery. That the Lord Jesus, whom several years before he had received late in life as his Redeemer, was not only the one who had changed his destination and get him out of hell and into heaven, but the one who, being risen from the dead, came by the Holy Spirit to indwell his humanity and be in him at all times one who's never, ever less than beginner. And he found that release of which Jesus said, when you abide in my word, you'll know the truth and the truth will set you free. But he said, you know, though I came back and I went and shared all this with the pastor and gave him one of those books, poor man, and he had to read it. And that's why you're here now. My wife never recovered. Four years. The room where my son slept is today exactly as it was four years ago. Nothing's been touched. I gave him this watch when he was a kid. And it's been in my wife's handbag for four years, the symbol of her despair. But last night when she came back from the meeting, she took it out of her handbag and said, would you give that to Major Thomas and he won't take it? Throw it in the river. And I realized 
that the clouds had begun to open and the sun had begun to shine. She too had discovered that Jesus is alive. The message of the early church. This Jesus whom they crucified. God raised from the dead. And of this we are witnesses. Not we only but by the one through whom we share his life on earth. The Holy Spirit. He too bears witness that Jesus is alive. He came to raise the dead. That's why I'm so glad I took this watch. And I've worn it much ever since to remind me of a boy with a broken heart who killed himself. And I wish only I'd had maybe the opportunity long before it happened to introduce him to somebody who would have been big enough even for those circumstances that then seemed so heavy that they could not but crush him. What a wonderful gospel. What good news God has entrusted to you and to me. But it's sad, isn't it, that whether it to receive him as redeemer or to enter into the good of his resurrection, we so often have to be on our back, scraping at the barrel, at the end of our rope. I was brought low and he helped me return. Return now, he said, with some joy in his heart. Return unto thy rest, <laughs> O oh, my soul. The psalmist has discovered that rest is the natural habitat of the soul that's united. Under the sovereignty of a living God. Mind, emotion and will. Restored to harmony. Recognizing his headship. The Lord hath dealt bountifully with me. This is how he puts it. Thou hast delivered my soul from death. Mine eyes from tears and my feet from falling. I'll walk. Now I'm going to walk. Before the Lord. In the land of the living. Isn't that a lovely expression? He says, I'm going to be numbered now amongst those who have been raised from the dead. I've discovered a principle to live by. I'm going to walk before the Lord, ever conscious, cognizant that he's there, caring enough to listen and always big enough to do something about it. I'm going to walk before the Lord. Do you remember that verse that I quoted the other evening from the Amplified New Testament in the Third chapter of Paul's epistle to the Philippians. This is what he meant. Only that I might know him. This is my determined purpose. That I may progressively, one step at a time, walking, become more deeply and intimately acquainted with him, perceiving, recognizing, understanding the wonders of his person more strongly and more clearly, that I may in that same way come to know the power outflowing from his resurrection, that which it exerts over believers, that if possible I may attain to the spiritual and moral resurrection that lifts me out from among the dead, even while still in the body. I'm going to be numbered amongst those who by the indwelling presence of Christ have been lifted out of that state of death in which I, in common with all mankind since Adam fell, were born. For he came to give us life. Walking before the Lord in the land of the living. Lifted out from among the dead even while still in the body. I know how to be abased and live humbly in straitened circumstances. I know also how to enjoy plenty and live in abundance. To me now, it's a matter of total irrelevance. I've learned in any and all circumstances the secret of facing every situation, whether well-fed or going hungry, having a sufficiency of despair or going without and being in want. So what? If only I'm in the place where God put me, strength for all things in Christ who empowers me. I'm ready for anything equal to anything through him who infuses inner strength into me. He is my life. That is, I'm self-sufficient in Christ's sufficiency. Because in him dwells all the fullness of the Godhead bodily. And I'm complete in him. In whom are hidden all the treasures of wisdom and of knowledge. In whom I've been blessed with every spiritual blessing in heavenly things. The one in whom I can reign in life by one Christ Jesus. Not just get by but be more than conqueror through him that loved me. I'll walk before the Lord in the land of the living. Is that where you're walking today? Walking before the Lord, not in self-opinion, not in bravado, but in a consciousness of your need, having graduated out of despair, recognizing your bankruptcy, 
that you were so engineered by God that the presence of the creator within the creature is at all times indispensable to his humanity. That man in normality is to be distinguished from the animal kingdom by a quality of life that cannot possibly be explained apart from God in the man because the Christian life is a miracle. It's not sensational or spectacular, but it must be miraculous. In the nitty-gritty, the little things that nobody else notices, those things that God looked at in the heart of a teenage girl and said to Gabriel, she has found favor. Those things that God looked at in the heart of a little boy when there was nobody around, save a lion and a bear, and they didn't live to tell the story. <laughs> but God's eyes, God's eyes were watching, watching, watching. He wasn't looking for anything spectacular in the presence of the crowd who could applaud and glorify the man. Only Jesus, looking unto him, I'll walk before the Lord in the land of the living. I believe, therefore have I spoken, because out of my experience of his adequacy, I've got something to say. What he says, verse 12, shall I render unto the Lord for all his benefits toward me? What can I give to God that would requite his kindness and his mercy? How can I reward him? And the psalmist finds himself in a great dilemma because he discovers that God is too rich and he's too poor. What can I give? And he comes to the conclusion that he has nothing to give. That isn't already by right. God's. So says he, in order to requite his mercy, that he might know my gratitude. Verse 13, I will take the cup of salvation and invoke his divine activity knowing that only that which has its origin in him can ever be eternally legitimate. I'll take, I'll take the cup of salvation and drink deep. I'll recognize all that God had in mind in sending his son not to get me out of hell and into heaven but to get him back out of heaven into me. And all I can do now is take. Take and say thank you. For, said he, verse 17, I'll offer to thee the, the sacrifice of thanksgiving. And I'll call upon the name of the Lord. You understand what that means? In every step he takes, no matter what the situation, he calls upon the name of the Lord. He invokes his divine activity. He bows himself out and bows God in. Marvelous. Walking before the Lord in the land of the living. Take and say, thank you. Rejoice evermore. Pray without ceasing. In everything give thanks. Not for everything. For there are many things in life for which we could not possibly thank him. But in the midst, no matter how threatening, how dark, how dangerous, in everything give thanks. Because he's never big enough, never less than big enough. And if he's never less than big enough and you're prepared to let him loose in the world in which you live, you're left with no option but to do what God's word says. The 19th verse, 5th chapter, last of the first epistle to the Thessalonians. Don't quench the spirit. Don't quench the spirit. In everything give thanks. This is the will of God in Christ Jesus concerning you. Don't believe that you can because you can't. But know that he can and he will. If you let him. If you let him. Marvelous. You know, it was my privilege some years ago to be in Aden. In the South Arabian Peninsula. The invitation of the Sudan Interior Mission. People in whom I've learned much to love in many parts of the world. I was there just for three days for a mission which was not only the Sudan interior mission. It was a sort of intermission sparked by SIM. We had to meet in the barracks because of the terrorist activity. We had barbed wire all round us and some netting so that nobody put a hand grenade in the offering. It was quite exciting. I was staying with a very delightful man called Bud Acord, whom some of you might know. He's now the representative of the Western States, lives near Colorado, <coughs> rather near uh, Denver, <coughs> Colorado Springs. And uh, he hadn't a clue what I was talking about. Not a clue. When I was talking about the life of Christ, the sole source of anything legitimate, that anything that we may do, no matter how skilled, no matter how devotedly with the best will in the world can be of any ultimate intrinsic value 
if it doesn't have its origin in Jesus Christ. He'd been sweating it out for God for so long. That to comprehend the rest that is theirs, whose hearts have been united in the recognition of his sole and exclusive lordship of our lives, it, it just was so hard to penetrate. But you know, on the last afternoon, we had some prayer together with one or two others in the team before the evening meeting, and I just turned to this 116th Psalm, take, and say thank you. I didn't know, because you seldom do, that then the Holy Spirit had taken the truth in general and applied it to his heart and made it the truth in particular. That's his business. You and I can't do that. That's why you can't legislate righteousness and you can't twist people's arms to make decisions for Jesus. If you do, you won't accomplish anything save the wood, the hay and the stubble of a wasted life that will go out in flames and leave you standing in a heap of ashes. You can't do God's work for him. Well, I didn't know what happened in his heart until about nine months later he called me from Los Angeles. He was so excited, the wires nearly fused. Well, I said, come up to uh, San Bernardino Mountains, Forest Home. I was having a conference there with our torchbearer friends and I said, I, I, can, I can recognize at once that you're just bursting to preach. So you better come and do a little preaching. Come and tell us what happened. So he did. He says, you know, when you'd gone with my colleague, we got down our knees and said, God, we've been here for 14 years. We've been two times back home on furlough. And every time we've come back, any possible fruit that we might have recognized as such had withered and disappeared. There was nothing left. We'd been here in this blistering heat. We've only known 14 people who've shown any real interest. And they've all gone. And we're sick and tired of the whole rat race. And yet out of sheer dogged determination and loyalty to yourself, we've stuck it out and we both want to quit. But there's been a man here tells us that if we'll quit and get out, you'll get in and do the job. Okay. You're in business. <laughs> and said he, if nothing happens when you're in business, we'll all quit. <laughs> Wasn't that great? You know, God loves a man to talk to him like that. He said, you know, three days later, there was a knock on the door, and there was an Arab. He said, how do I become a Christian? Well, of course, I didn't get the message. I said, sorry, I can't give you money. I could give you a little food, and I don't know how to obtain any kind of housing for you or your family. And if it's a question of education in the United States or England, and the man's face was blank. He said, I didn't say anything about any of that. I said, how do I become a Christian? And finally, it penetrated his thick skull that there was a man there who wanted to get saved. And he led him to Christ. And almost every day, for a couple of weeks, people were knocking on the door, lining up to get saved. You won't believe this, but you can go and meet him. He lives near Colorado Springs. I'll give you his address and I'll give you his phone number. And he'll be as excited today as he was then, because he is. <laughs> anyway, 14 days later, they got down their knees again and said, God, this isn't even funny. <laughs> We've been sweating it out for 14 years and in 14 days more people have knocked on our doors without being invited than ever we thought in 14 years had responded to our preaching. Now, said they to him, if this is you doing something, send a woman because we've never seen a woman respond. A couple of days later, <laughs> there was a woman. And he said the windows open and poured us out such blessing that we could hardly contain it. And then, when the British government told us to all get out, you might have imagined that our hearts would have been broken because this was what we had been longing and praying for. But he said we couldn't care less because we knew that it was nothing whatever to do with us. And that if he could use us in that way, then he could use anybody else, even of those who had come to Christ without a missionary. And so we gladly left, and he had a whale of a time in the Lebanon, then he went to the west coast of Africa, and he teaches constantly in our Bible schools, as excited today as he was then about the fact that this Jesus, whom they crucified, God raised from the dead. There's nothing we can offer to him save a heart that takes and says thank you and become expendable. Then you can say, I'm a Christian. Now let's pray.
Teach us, loving Saviour, the sublime simplicity of the gospel. Knowing that so easily Satan, as he once, in all his subtleties, seduced and deceived Eve. We too may have our minds corrupted from the simplicity which is in Christ. We want you this morning, Lord Jesus, to know that we recognize you to be the source in us of anything that is legitimate. That we want to be involved in nothing that does not have its origin in your sovereignty exercised as king back in your kingdom. That only what you do in and through us is of any validity. And we're available. We have no preconceived notions as to what you're going to do, how you're going to do it, or where you're going to do it. We recognize that is not within our jurisdiction. We are members of your body, of which you alone and exclusively are the head. We realize that that involves for us no decisions to make, save to be obedient. Only instructions to obey. And you've promised to give them. And we don't even have to ask how. Because that being your promise, that too is your problem. Thank you. For a future that's as big as God. Every horizon beckons us, heavy with blessing, golden with prospect. And we're glad, as some may be in these days will, to graduate out of despair, the bitterness of self-discovery, to know our own bankruptcy and trade, our poverty for your wealth, our weakness for your strength, our defeat for your victory. We'll step out with a new light in our eyes to take the only way we can say thank you and let you be God in action in your own peerless name Jesus our Lord Amen You've been listening to a sermon by Major Ian Thomas If you've been blessed by this sermon you can find more sermons by him and additional resources on this subject at pathtoprayer.com Again, if you've been blessed by this sermon, you can find more sermons by Major Ian Thomas at pathtoprayer.com as well as other resources.